Hello, welcome to the Axis Turning Podcast. This week we are pleased to be bringing you a Flair member of the Ask Historian community, user Party Moses, um, who was flared in 19th century American military, War of 1812, um, better known to his friends and family as Adam Moses. And this is a really great interview where we kind of talk about the whole scope of the War of 1812, his thesis, and some of the new arguments that are being made by his thesis about the War of 1812. As always, please do support us on Patreon. You can find us at there at patreon.com slash askhistorians. For as little as $1 a month, you can support the work we are doing here and enter yourself in a book drawing. And if you would have more and would like to donate to the great cause of history, please do so. Again, that's patreon.com slash askhistorians. Now, here's the show. Welcome the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I am pleased to be your host this week, Brian Watson. Today, we are joined by a flared member of the Ask Historians community, user Pardy Moses. He is flared in 19th century American military, the War of 1812, and he has done a fantastic job of answering important questions around these two things as a flared user. He's better known to his friends and family as Adam Franti. And we will be talking today kind of in general terms about the War of 1812, um, also focusing on his master's thesis, which centers around nationalistic historical narratives of the war that unfairly criticized the militia in his opinion. And Adam also used to give tours about the War of 1812 at Fort Mackinac, so he's sure to have a lot of insight. First things first, welcome to the Ask Historian podcast, Adam. Hey, thanks for having me. So I usually like to begin these podcasts asking what really got you interested in history in the first place? I mean, you did a master's thesis about it, so I'm assuming you're interested in it. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I, and it probably you know, sounds just like everybody else who's been through something like this, but uh, I don't honestly recall a time when I wasn't interested in history in, in some respect or another. Um, I remember reading uh, a lot of fantasy when I was younger, and I really liked you know, knights and castles and everything. And uh, I remember taking a class in fourth grade where we talked about castles in the Middle Ages and everything, and that just sort of caught my attention. And I've paid attention to it ever since. Um, obviously, my topics of interest have changed quite a bit, but <laughs> uh, you know, even as, a, as like a six-year-old kid, I remember telling my dad I wanted to be a, uh, an archaeologist, which I thought dug up dinosaur bones. Uh, and I was wrong in some of those particulars, but you know, the passion for, for the past was always there. So castles to the war of 1812, that actually is quite a big leap. Did you um, do history in undergrad as well? I did, yeah. Uh, I actually double majored in history and uh, creative writing. Uh, I, I took a lot more English classes than I did history classes, mostly because I think we had uh, slightly more resources at Central Michigan, which is where I went, that were aimed toward having mm -hmm. a lot more interesting classes in, in you know, on the folklore side and on the English and literature and that kind of thing. So by the time I rolled around to applying for graduation, I had just as many credits in English as I did in history. So I figured, you know, go for both. Um, yeah, might as well have both of them, right? Yeah, yeah. And then how did you decide to go for a master's in history after that? Well, I got a summer job uh, at Fort Mackinac, uh, like you said. And I know for anybody who isn't actually from Michigan, uh, I know Mackinac is spelled the way that it sounds, right? But it's actually pronounced Mackinac. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a very weird linguistic trip to get there, but you know, I can, anybody can tell instantly that you're not from Michigan. If you pronounce it with the, the hard ack at the end there, uh, I must, I must admit, I am not in fact from Michigan. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, the, even, even back in, uh, we actually have, um, one of the guys who used to be the Fort Commandant at Michel Mackinac. This was before it was moved to Mackinac Island was a poet. And, uh, he has uh, a lot of old poems where he rhymes things like attack with Mackinac. So even you know, <laughs> over 200 years ago, people were still doing the same things pronunciation wise and everything. So it's not really a big deal. Um, I, <laughs> I ended up getting a summer job there as a, a park interpreter. And so my job was basically, you know, dressed up in the, the military uniforms. They mostly represented the 1880s. So we had, you know, trapdoor rifles and the blue uniforms and talked to people mostly about the Civil War, even though it was 20 years out of period. But uh, Fort Mackinac was captured in the War of 1812. And so in 2012, the second year that I worked there, we started doing uh, interpretive programs about the War of 1812. So it was partly my job that summer to research, you know, find out as much as I could about the fort's role and about the war as a whole. And it was just a 
the strangest little war I'd ever read about. And it just it <laughs> fascinated me. And I remember actually very early when I was reading about this, being really, really interested in the idea of the militia as, as a war fighting force and, uh, and as a political force and something that, you know, when you look at it one angle or another, it seems either that it worked perfectly or it didn't work at all or combinations of both. And it just, I, I remember reading about that and wanting to know as much as I possibly could about it. So that's generally like, I, I would say that your field of history is um, of the field of the longest running history, which is the field of military history, which has actually gotten maligned in the past few years, but it seems like you seem to have a very different take on it. Um, how would you say you kind of look at yourself as a military historian? I think one of the I think one of the reasons that military history tends to be somewhat fairly uh, criticized is that there are a lot of people who come from a military background who approach history through a military lens, and when they write books, they tend to be these sort of popular fire-offs, right? And, you know, I study um, American history in the nineteenth century. You're always going to run into things about the Civil War. Mm -hmm. You know, there there are a lot of uh, I think military historians who are looking at how an army is run, how an army is fed. And they're looking at it in terms of its war fighting ability. And that's not really what interests me um, about the military. I think um, what I've sort of come around to, and you know, this is after months of trying to polish up statements of research interest for PhD programs and everything. But what I'm interested in is, is the sort of cultural expression that military service allows uh, men to sort of publicly inhabit this, this sort of, all of these nestled ideas about what a soldier is, and what a war is, and that kind of thing. So my, my take on this is more that I like studying the cultural aspects of the military. You know, when does a culture feel like it needs to have, like we have today, the most enormous overfunded military in the world, Yeah. as opposed to, you know, in the early 19th century, when one of the few things that both sides of the political spectrum agreed on was that they didn't want a standing army. Um, hmm. And I think those questions are just as important to you know, victory or defeat in a war as, as as anything else is, you know, the size of your cannons or the number of guns that you have on your ships and that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's those little kind of, I think, thornier political cultural questions that interest me a lot more. Almost like how, uh, like you said, like the militia is like, a, becomes a cultural idea, like in the sense of like, oh, the militia, but like you're, you're talking about like how they're represented in culture and carried throughout historians. Right. That's really interesting. If you haven't heard the um, episode on sex in the Civil War, um, you might want to actually read out to that flair because he also is interested in kind of like how the military uh, is treated as a cultural icon and how thing it kind of manifests um, through. He, he studies the sexual culture of the Civil War, but he had a lot to say about how the military becomes like almost an item in culture. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. And that what I've sort of nailed down in, in general ideas now when uh, approaching, you know, grad school uh, or PhD programs is I don't necessarily want to lean too hard on the fact that I study the military um, because that comes with a lot of connotations I'd rather not deal with. But um, mm -hmm. what I like to imagine is, is what I study is public masculinity, right? The pressures that kind of put on men to represent themselves as very particular kinds of men in certain public or private spheres. Um, and, and again, things like the militia are, are perfect for that, right? Uh, when, when a militiaman puts on the uniform that he has, that he's, he's sort of wearing all these cultural expectations, literally on his, on his sleeves. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, there aren't too many other things that I see that kind of, kind of roll up all of those things that I'm interested in into one little neat topic. That's even that's now I'm even more interested because uh, in a way I say that I I also study history of masculinity through studying pornography in a sense it's it's because it's so much a male focused and a male created and a male um, sponsored field that I never would have thought of kind of relating um, military history the like, like sort of cultural pornographic history I do but like in, if you look at it that way it actually is quite a bit of yeah, overlap yeah and I think you know one of one of the great things about the field uh, just in history in general right now is that it's it's allowing for maybe the first time in its history, you know, that there are so there's such a diversity of voices and there's such a diversity of, of viewpoints. And one of the things that I think doesn't get studied that much is this kind of masculine pressure, um, right? Mm -hmm. where, where if the expectation is that, you know, history is, is the story of rich white men, you know, there's, yeah. there's obviously that is uh, something we should try to get away from, but studying kind of those 
attitudes and expectations, I think, is just as valuable as, as getting a lot, of, a lot of these lost voices that are now sort of starting to become much more popular means of exploring history. Um, because you, a lot of people don't look at it critically, right? It's, it's just the starting point. It says we have all these ideas about this war, it's justified or, or you know, whatever the topic might be. Um, but really trying to unpack mm -hmm. that and getting into the head of somebody who is acting in a certain way, not because they think that it's the right thing to do, but they think that's what their culture has told them is the right thing to do. Um, and I think, you know, again, I've said three times now, but I think, you know, the military and uh, the history of warfare is a really good way to kind of distill a lot of those ideas. Um, so I don't, all I know about the war of 1812 is one uh, from this arrogant worm song, which I've never, don't know if you ever heard, but it, it, the, the refrain in the song is like, the refrain in the song is go, uh, it's a Canadian comedy band. They're fanning the song that goes, uh, the White House burned, 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 and we're the ones that did it. It burned, 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 and the Americans ran and cried like a bunch of little babies. Went, went, I think I definitely, I have heard this. I haven't heard it in a long time, but I have heard the song. Yeah. Okay, so that, and uh, that, that's kind of my understanding of the entirety of the War of 1812. There are worse so, starting points, to be honest. So, <laughs> you, you wouldn't be, you'd be amazed at how many people, you know, would approach us at the fort and, and say, Oh, the War of 1812, you know, is, that's when the British try to conquer us again, huh? And all of course, you know, to, <laughs> to these tourists being the United States. Um, and that, I think, is, is a, a lot more difficult to unpack than, you know, the idea that the Americans attempted to invade and were, you know, got the tar beaten out of them and ran back to their burning White House. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, let, let's unpack that. Um, what what were some of the causes of the war? It seemed to come out of nowhere, from my understanding of American so, history. There were, um, you know, like anything, like any good story, it's really complicated. But it, there's essentially three kind of major causes that are all of them are decades in the making, uh, if not longer. Um, but most of them are taken advantage of by uh, the Madison administration and uh, earlier the Jefferson administration in a in a way that sort of in, in a way scored them political points in, in the way that they sort of postured against Great Britain. Um, none of this would have been possible without the Napoleonic Wars. So if, if Napoleon hadn't been, you know, basically running around Europe and causing like the largest war the world had ever seen at that point, um, the Americans, I don't think, would have been able to get away with anything that they were attempting to do. Um, so because the British were distracted and because of the pressures of that war, the British had a couple of policies that were really unpopular to the Americans. And uh, one of them was a trade restriction um, policy that was called uh, the Orders in Council. It was one of many Orders in Council, but that's what it sort of came to be known uh, known of, uh, known as uh, the American side of things. But it essentially prevented neutral vessels from, um, from trading with France. And this was just an economic pressure to put on Napoleonic France. And it was a way that uh, was the British, again, trying to bottle Napoleon up in Western Europe rather than let him rampage around everywhere else. Uh, the Americans obviously looked at this and said, well, you know, you shouldn't be able to tell us where we can trade or not. Uh, and at this, you know, this is um, early, early 19th century, but even by about 1803 or 1804, the Americans had the largest sort of neutral merchant fl shipping fleet in the world. Uh, and most of the, the mm -hmm. trade income and a lot of the tax revenue actually came from trade. So even for the Madison administration, which are uh, in the Jefferson administration at the time, which knew that most of their political rivals were the kind of people that made money trading internationally. Um, there was so much tax revenue that came in through that trade that they really wanted to keep it going uh, to sometimes hilarious effects uh, later on. But we'll, we can come back to that if we do, if we have time. Mm -hmm. So the Orders and Council was the first big one. And this was really unpopular. But as part of this, right, the British, again, um, are attempting to bottle up Napoleonic France, and they're blockading pretty much every single port that they can. Uh, they're attempting to keep French fleets from operating in the Mediterranean, the North, North Atlantic, and everywhere else. Uh, and that needs a lot of ships, and ships need a lot of manpower. Uh, I mean, this is a, a fairly mid-tier ship, and the British Navy would have said, had several hundred sailors, um, you know, in, in different shifts, working basically around the clock to make sure the thing didn't, like, crash into a stone and sink, Right. <laughs> uh, and, and it needed many, many more because the turnover rate of Royal Navy sailors and the sickness and death uh, rate was astronomical. So one of the ways that the British um, mm -hmm. attempted to kind of keep their manpower uh, up to speed was uh, with what they called impressment. And impressment was just a process by which the Royal Navy 
uh, had the legal right, as, as according to you know the British government, to stop neutral vessels. And this mostly was code for American vessels, but they stopped vessels of every other neutral nation um, around Europe at the time too. Uh, and they started, they would search them for known British deserters or former British citizens. Um, so unlike what it was sort of told of in the American press, they weren't stopping and seizing American sailors just with no cause whatsoever. It, they were specifically looking for men who had been citizens of the country, who had served in the Royal Navy before, and mostly deserters. Um, in 1807, mm -hmm. this kind of came to a head with what they called the Chesapeake Affair. And the USS Chesapeake was fired on by a British Royal Navy vessel, was boarded, and they found four Royal Navy deserters, um, one of whom was named Ratford Jenkins, who had actually deserted from one of the ships as part of a blockade of Chesapeake Bay, went into uh, the harbor, and then when he saw one of the captains of the British fleet when he came on shore, basically yelled insults at him in the street. And so the British knew that he had gone on the Chesapeake and had apparently requested the captain of the Chesapeake to heave to so they could find Jenkins. When the captain refused, they fired on the ship, uh, boarded it, and caught these deserters and everything. And this almost led to a war in 1807. So we could have had the War of 1807. But so with all those going on, Britain was a popular target uh, and always had been since the revolution. The war probably wouldn't have happened if there wasn't at least kind of like a third leg of these causes. And that was what sort of, there was a whole bundle of different things that more or less came to be known as the, the Indian problem. The United States is a small country. You know, it has annexed a lot of new territory, mostly at the at the cost of Native Americans. And they had fought the first international war after the revolution was actually the United States fighting against a confederation of Native Americans in the Great Lakes territory. Um, this was famous uh, Anthony Wayne's Legion. It ended in 1794. They signed a treaty called the Treaty of Greenville, and the Americans almost instantly started violating the treaty. Uh, about 10 years later, there was a Shawnee whose name at the time was Lala Wathika, who, which is Shawnee for like the rattle or the loud mouth. Uh, he was known as a, as a drunk, as a wastrel. He actually had uh, a droopy eye because he had gotten into a fight with somebody who smashed a bottle across his face. And he fell asleep next to a fire and allegedly was visited by the great spirit and became a leader of this kind of Shawnee led spiritual revival that was actually attempting to unite all of the Native Americans on the continent against the United States specifically. So there was a sort of racialized language about it, but more or less Tenskwatawa, who had changed his name from Lala Watika to something that was a little bit more flattering. It means the open door. He was also generally known as the prophet, right? He talked to the great spirit. So he starts forming this, this uh, coalition, but they're generally pretty okay if there are British agents that are, <laughs> that are doing things for them and bringing them trade goods and whatnot. And if they tend to be Amer if they're Americans, they say, you know, keep away, stay off. Because even by, seven, you know, 1805, 1806, Americans have a reputation as being treaty breakers. You know, you make a treaty with them, then they'll instantly violate it. And a lot of this has to do with the decentralization of the government at the time and the impossibility of governing people who decide to leave the country and go into Indian country and set up their own home, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh this was a, a point of contention in American politics for decades. Uh, this was something that, that um, George Washington and, and John Adams had actually sent federal troops into Indian territory, not to fight Indians, but to kick off white squatters and get them back into American territory because they were so sensitive to the idea that they signed a treaty and they were going to stand by it. Jefferson and Madison were not very friendly to Native interests, and so they had a much more... Um, their idea was more to support Americans regardless of their legality and to basically, you know, for lack of a better way to explain it, uh, Jefferson orchestrated a lot of policies that were entirely intended of, of stripping title away from Native Americans and giving that title to Americans to sell. And that was uh, something that was acutely pressuring the Shawnee. It's one of the things that sort of led to the religious revival. And the idea was in American politics that the Indians obviously can't do this on their own, right? I mean, why would they be able to? They're not that smart. Obviously, mm -hmm. this is not something I believe, but this was a common belief at the time. Um, and that uh, Tenskwatawa and eventually his brother Tecumseh, who came to be much better known later, uh, were not actually working alone. They were working in concert with the British. And there's actually a letter by Andrew Jackson at one point who says that um, the prophet and his brother Tecumseh's are an engine set in motion by the British. And this was obviously a devious plot by the by the British to 
negate any territorial gains that the Americans are making and to sort of curtail their ability to run their own country in the way that they want. Um, so these, these three th things all sort of combined into the notion that in order to, to be successful, in order to, to have a nation that can run its own affairs, uh, that the United States needed to declare war on Great Britain. So those were the three kind of major causes that led up to them. Obviously, there are, there are sort of little nodes we can attach all sorts of different things to, but those are kind of the three kind of crystal clear ideas from the American point of view. Real the British mm. and the Canadians. Sorry. All they wanted to do was was keep their territory sovereign. They didn't want to be conquered. The British did not want to reconquer the United States. They didn't want to. It actually took them a very long time to agree that they should try to invade the United States at all, even when the war had been going on for a year or more. All of their concern was keeping North America from being conquered and fighting Napoleon. We, like I started here, you know, Napoleon was the the biggest factor in this whole thing. If if Napoleon hadn't been around, hadn't been operating, this war probably never would have happened. So I think my first reaction is that I am shocked to find out that Jefferson, a foreign slave owner, would have supported racist treaties. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, the, the more I talk about, about the War of 1812 to people, like, the more you can see that their their idea of Thomas Jefferson as a really good guy sort of starts diminishing and diminishing and diminishing. <laughs> the longer I keep talking. <laughs> What I, I often hear this idea of like manifest destiny um, around the American ideas, but like that wasn't like one of the reasons that you really cited. So it, was it really a, a pushing cause that Americans thought they should control Canada as well? It's it's not very clear it, it, that that idea is not really articulated until after the war. Um, there are definitely ideas that contribute to the idea of manifest destiny that are you know way before the War of 1812 and that kind of thing. But I think one of the the big things was that the Federalist Party, uh, which in starting in 1800 was the party of opposition. It was the party of, of John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, even though those two barely agreed on anything. Um, they were sort of a looser affiliation of people that believed very different things about the way the country should progress. And this is this is one of the things we'll probably talk to when we get to the end of the war. But real quickly, the the War of 1812 essentially shattered the Federalist Party. Uh, there was really no sort of meaningful party of opposition afterward. And so a lot of the ideas that are bandied about in the Republican side, the Democratic Republican Party, which is what Jefferson and Madison were part of, they were the party that kind of tended to think, you know, Americans deserve this territory, this Indian territory, right? We deserve to own the continent, we deserve this kind mm -hmm. of thing. And they those were controversial until the end of the War of 1812. There are some other political decisions in the early 1820s that sort of lead to it, but but that notion isn't really quite as mature, and it's not articulated as clearly as it is later on in in, in the in the century. Okay, that's interesting. So if we zoom further down, we zoom right down to the like May of eighteen twelve. What happens that we'll be fighting a war in June? So it's it's um it's unclear about the timing. There's nothing really that triggers it. Um, a few months earlier in November of uh, eighteen eleven. Um, William Henry Harrison, who was the territorial governor of the Indiana Territory, which at the time sort of wrapped around um, parts of Illinois and Wisconsin as well. So it was essentially the western side of the Great Lakes. Uh, he led a, a small army of mostly militia and a few regulars uh, against Prophetstown, which was a town that was set up by Tenskwatawa, deliberate provo provocation to American territory. And he did that basically by putting uh, putting Provincetown just a few miles east of the Treaty of Greenville boundary and essentially, you know, was thumbing his nose at, at Harrison the whole time. So Harrison actually got up this army and went and they had the, the Battle of Fallen Timbers, uh, excuse me, the Battle of Tippecanoe. And it was a defeat for Provincetown natives, mostly because they ran out of ammunition in the middle of the night and ran away. And the Americans kind of held the field in the morning and then burned Provincetown to the ground. And this was just a few months, mm -hmm. just maybe six months or so before the war was declared. But this was something that was just maturing for a long time. And I think June of 1812 was just about the time that the American government could foster enough support to declare war. So this was a declared war. It wasn't, you know, something that we have now like a policing action or um, a use of military <laughs> force against Native Americans on the border or anything like that. It was something that was absolutely declared, and it was actually the tightest vote for support of a war in American history. And we 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 roll really into June before the conflict gets started. What's kind of the American strategy to begin with? The Americans are, on paper, they look very good. They have an army on paper that's about 10,000 men strong. Uh, and this was actually quite big for 
the American army. And again, like I said earlier, the, the idea of having a standing army of any size is politically controversial, especially for the Democratic Republicans who don't want to spend any money on an army. They barely want to spend money on a on a navy or anything like that. So we have a uh, uh, the Americans that is has have about ten thousand men on paper in the army, even though they didn't. They had maybe around seven thousand, just because they can't recruit huh. enough men to 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 fill in in the army. The pay wasn't good enough. the The job was dangerous and backbreaking. It was not a popular uh, profession at at all. <laughs> um, but the biggest thing was the Americans actually have more than a hundred thousand or almost three hundred thousand militia. And a, a militiaman at the time, and we'll get into this in more detail, is basically any citizen of the country that is a person, a white male, generally, who owns property of some kind, who has a, an interest, is what the, the term they used at the time, in a, a local community. And they are obligated to not only own a weapon, but a military weapon that can usually is either a rifle or a musket that can, that can uh, hold a bayonet. Right? This is a military weapon. Uh, not just a hunting piece or a fowling piece or shotgun or anything like that. Um, and usually it meant having a uniform. Some other, uh, some some places actually had their militia was mounted. Uh, Kentucky was actually pretty well known for having mounted militia uh, and riflemen. Uh, other other towns could actually say, well, we don't actually have men, you know, with muskets, but we have a cannon, so <laughs> they can be uh, the militia by serving as a gun crew for you know a, a non federally owned cannon. <laughs> But uh, so they have about 300,000 uh, of those men. And the idea is that even if not all of the militia go, because these are state militias for the most part, and they're distributed in a way that seems kind of weird uh, and illogical to us now. But um, the idea is th th there's such a weight in manpower that the Americans were just going to overwhelm the Canadian border with men, as many men as they could. So the idea was that, we're, that they're going to invade from the Great Lakes, from the far western edge of the United States at the time. Uh, right across the Detroit River, uh, and they're going to head basically from there east, and they're going to link up with another invasion that went off uh, across the Niagara uh, River. Mm -hmm. And the third invasion was going to go up the Lake Champlain Corridor, is what they called it. Uh, and the three of them were just essentially going to spread out the British forces so thin, they maybe had about 3,000 redcoats in the country total, and they had 90,000 militia countable. So the Americans outnumbered them, you know, from a very, very comfortable margin. And the idea was, the strategy was, just overwhelm the border as much as you possibly can. And once that, uh, the Canadians will surrender, the British will go home, and we'll figure out what to do with Canada after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to just turn to those militiamen um, before we dive like a little bit more into like the actual details of the war. What, what sort of people... Were they? Um, were they all generally just men? Um, do they have a varied background? Do they come just from the upper classes? It depends very largely on where exactly these hypothetical people would be from. Um, basically, the, the system itself was something that even as far back as about King Philip's War, nobody really liked. If you think about this like jury duty, that's probably where most people are stand on the question of militia, whether they're going to serve in the militia. Like, it's an obligation and it's an annoyance more than it is something that they can feel really proud of. And that's, that's obviously not universal, but popularly um, when we look at records of musters and, and people trying to get out of going to musters and get out of their obligations to serve in the militia, it's, it's much more a story of people, again, trying to avoid it rather than people proudly serving in it. And there are exceptions to that. Um, but for the most part, you see people who are generally very wealthy uh, and people who are eyeing political careers. Um, who tend to be the people that are kind of in charge. These are the people like William Henry Harrison, who is a territorial governor and also the general of the Indiana militia. You see men like the Van Rensselaers from New York, who have you know always served and always supported the militia because to them it was something that kind of boosted their um, their public persona, right? You can be a, a gentleman mm -hmm. of leisure, and that also means that you're obligated to serve, to protect your own interests and your own property, and you're going to do that in the way you best know how, which is to lead men. So one of what well, kind of one of my favorite little anecdotes about this kind of thing is when the um, the whiskey rebellion mm -hmm. in the 1790s, the the Americans were trying to hastily throw together this militia army to counter the militia army that was forming to ostensibly overthrow the government, right? And one of the things that was happening is like, okay, we need men, and the war office is flooded flooded with letters, hundreds of letters coming from people saying that I would love to serve as an officer in the militia. When it actually came to recruiting men, they got maybe a couple of hundred. 
total. And they were trying to recruit like 10,000 men for this little militia army, right? And everyone mm -hmm. is like, well, I, I would absolutely love to do it if you make me an officer. But if they're told, well, no, you got to be a private, then they're probably just going to go home. So everybody really wants, they, they want to use the militia as a way to sort of boost, again, their public persona and their, their reputation, rather than actually look at it as something that they're, they're willing to serve in. But sort of more broadly, um, anyone who was a citizen from usually about 18, sometimes to as old as 60, was obligated to serve in the militia. And there were various proposals across various states about how to, how to change that up and how to make it more efficient and how to make it less onerous. But for the most part, kind of broadly, if you're generally white, not always, though, as we'll talk about in probably a couple minutes, you own property, you can afford to equip yourself as a soldier, um, you're serving in the militia in one capacity or another. And sometimes it might be just fire watch at night when you're walking around town, making sure that things aren't burning down to going to probably a once yearly muster, which sometimes turned out to just be a night drinking with your buddies. <laughs> <laughs> and it really depends on locality. I mean, if you look at the, um, the Kentucky cavalry, um, like I said earlier, in, in the War of 1812, I mean, this is an exemplary, like a famous group of men, and they are technically militia. And that's something that's not often discussed, right? When when we think of the militia, we think of the guys who refuse to serve. We think of the guys mm -hmm. when quite a lot of the, the men who actually served in the War of 1812 were non-federal, right? They were they were not actually serving soldiers. They were men of the militia who had volunteered for specific duties. I know a lot of historians tend to blame the militia for the, I guess, the loss of the War of 1812. So why why do they get blamed over the uh, over the army? I guess it doesn't seem to me like the army's primary responsibility would be to win the war, but the militia is the one who get blamed. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so a lot of that comes down to politics, and this was largely what my thesis focused on. Right? Was was the narratives that that come out of the War of eighteen twelve that are written by men who were there, and believe it or not, a lot of the narratives that are popular are written by people who later had long careers in the American <laughs> government. So we have guys like Ray Harrison and we have people like Winfield Scott, uh, the Van Rensselaers, for instance. So these are men who are, who are prominent, who are very well known. And after the war, when you need somebody to blame for failure, and you can either blame somebody like Winfield Scott, who is the highest ranking military, you know, military man in the country by the 1850s. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can say, well, you know, we probably would have won that battle if the New York militia had just decided to go across the river. So What's happening is, is these men are kind of zeroing in on a couple of incidents, and there's actually only a very small handful, uh, a couple of incident, incidents where men of the militia famously, sort of notoriously refused to cross the border into Canada. Mm -hmm. And remember, the entire crux of the war is don't worry about what we're going to do afterward, just worry about capturing Canada. Um, but legally, there was this ambiguity. And the ambiguity is about how exactly to interpret the clauses of the Constitution that relate to the militia specifically. And one of them is whether or not the militia can serve overseas. And when you think about the word overseas, it seems fairly clear. But then when you think about yeah. Canada, Canada's not really over the sea, yeah. is it? Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> you want to find it. <laughs> right. So um, in Congress, even like, you know, it's going through in the lead up when everybody kind of knew that the United States was going to go to war at some point. They, they're talking about this specific clause, the overseas, right? What does that mean? Does that mean that uh, only, you know, the militia can't be obligated to serve only across international borders? Or does that mean that um, men can't, uh, you can't force men to serve outside their state or outside their region? Like there's a lot of ambiguity about that really tiny thing. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different ideas about what exactly mm -hmm. that meant. So that was part of the problem, right? If you have men who are standing in Michigan, in the morning and you say, all right, we're going to go across and capture Windsor or sandwich as it was called at the time. And you've got a bunch of men who say, well, uh, I'm not going to do that. You know, you haven't fed us yet. <laughs> we haven't been paid yet. I, we don't have shoes or blankets or tents. Yeah. Uh, then, then you can kind of look at that and say, well, you know, if they had just gone across that time, we would have won the war. Uh, so this happened in, uh, like I said, across the Detroit River at one point. It also happened again in um, the, the Battle of Queenston Heights, which was probably the more dramatic version of that story. Uh, and there are lots of men who were there who say, you know, there are these men of the Pennsylvania militia who are just standing on, on the border of this river with their arms crossed and their weapons on the ground and refusing any, any possibility of, of actually going across the river. And this was allegedly 
what made us lose or made the Americans lose the Battle of Queenston Heights. This was a, a second or third attempt to invade Canada at the time, and the American forces were eventually thrown back, even after a pretty good start. But uh, but it's it's incidents like that that really kind of popularized the idea that the militia was a poor war fighting institution in the in the country, mm-hmm. and so because of that, saying relying on the militia categorically is one of the way one of the reasons that the Americans lost the war, rather than even just the kind of high profile drama of saying, well, this specific notion they lost us that battle, right? It's it sort of changes into this idea that the the militia has always been untrustworthy, and we never should have looked at it at the same time. Purely because it <laughs> to, it failed to win a war that was deeply unpopular, right? And this is the citizenry of the country. These are um, the, the famous phrase is the it's the body of citizens in arms. And if if you've got you know fifty percent of your citizenry don't support the war, of course, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> but then when you get the guys who are actually there on the day of the battle, these are the men who didn't go home when they had opportunity to do so. Right. These are the men that are staying there despite being freezing cold and not having tents and not having shoes and not being fed and being paid. So it, it's very difficult to actually kind of point to any group of people and say, well, those men supported the war and those men didn't. So generally you just say, well, the whole, you know, the whole militia is lumped into this kind of useless thing. So hmm. it must be their fault. I can kind of see why you're, where, where the skepticism in your thesis is coming from that the militia are actually to blame. <laughs> right. Um. So... I know that um, you mentioned that Fort Mackinac, right? Or Mackinac. 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 Okay. I know you mentioned Fort Mackinac kind of being the center of the war. And I know Detroit is also like really important to the war. Um, What can you tell us about what happened at that fort and um, William William Hull too, I believe? Yeah. Um, So William Hull was uh, an aging veteran of the, the American Revolution. Uh, and he was the governor of Michigan. He was appointed the governor of Michigan in 1805. And he, you know, maybe not, he might not have been the best choice uh, as like a general in the field, but he was the guy that was there. He had a reputation of being able to do it. And he was just the guy that happened to be in charge. So for whatever reason, he ended up being a pretty deeply unpopular commander. And it was mostly when men of the Ohio militia showed up, right? So there was this schism between William Hull and the Ohio militia pretty early on. But to, there's a book that I think is okay. <laughs> I was disappointed when I first got to it as part of reading my thesis, but it, it's um, the the fall and capture the or the fall and recapture of the of the of Fort Detroit in the War of 1812. Okay, and in defense of William Hull. And the book's thesis is, as you can imagine, it, it's sort of trying to exonerate William Hull as this sort of failure, right? So the broad sketches of what happened in Detroit. William Hull shows up, his men don't like him, his militia refuse to follow him, and he attempts to invade Canada, does so, issues a proclamation that is insightful and does exactly the opposite of what it wanted to do, which was to get the Canadians to not fight him. Sort of putzes around in Windsor, or Sandwich at the time, and then turns back around, and the Canadians immediately follow him, invade across the Detroit River, surround Fort Detroit, and bombard it for a couple of days, and then capture it. So William Hull surrenders with like 2,500 men in the fort, um, which actually outnumbered the the British attackers. And so he's immediately castigated across uh, American papers and American kind of popular ideas. He's ended, he ends up being actually court-martialed and found guilty of treason. And wow. he's actually sentenced to be hanged when, when President Madison commutes the sentence and says, you know, because of time served basically because of his, his stature as a hero of the of the American Revolution, we're going to spare his life. But he was convicted wow. of treason. So that, that kind of tells how much, how much hatred there was for this guy at the time. So the book, In Defense of William Hull, lays out what I find is generally, for the most part, a fairly convincing thesis that it wasn't necessarily his fault. He, he mm-hmm. was just sort of a fall guy. A lot of what happens was, so when Hull actually marches from New York, which is where he was when the war broke out, to collect his militia army in Urbana, Ohio, he has to march up to Detroit. And this seems like, well, yeah, you just, you know, march up Detroit. They've, they've got freeways. <laughs> but in 1812, they actually had to march through what they called the Black Swamp, which was this swampy morass of just terrible, muddy, sucky, gross ground and a giant forest, all within walking distance of the Detroit River. It's <laughs> usually how people get around. Um, if, if you went to, um, if you went to Detroit, you know, anywhere probably in the first 20 years of the 19th century or before, you're very mm-hmm. likely to get there by canoe. 
problem is the British have more boats on the Detroit River than the Americans do. So going by boat is actually really difficult and dangerous. So Hull um, has to basically take his men and cut a road, like literally cut trees down and build a road from Urbana, Ohio, all the way up to Detroit. Wow. And he does this over a couple of weeks. And if you follow the letters that he wrote back to the War Department, you know, once every couple of days, he's filled with nothing but praise for the way that the, the militia are operating, right? He says, like, they're in swampy territory. It's raining all the time, but they couldn't be more cheerful. And they have like little little tape in their hats that says conquer or die, right? Like these guys are ready to go. And this is actually months before the war even starts. So this is like preparation for this invasion already going before the war is declared. Um, and they seem very eager to go. And so he, when he gets to Detroit, he starts talking immediately about, okay, we've got problems with supply. Because if we're going to go into Canada, we're going to need to keep our men supplied the whole way. And the only way to get there is up stockpiling supplies in Detroit. The only way to get to Detroit is the road that he just cut or the lakes. So we either need to control the lakes or we need to make sure that that road is safe one way or another. So he keeps, he sends letter after letter after letter to the war department saying like, we absolutely need to deal with this problem before I am comfortable risking my men mm -hmm. to go invade Canada. Right. So, uh, there are a couple of battles because they're trying to get supplies up to, up to Detroit and they keep getting attacked by um, Native Americans under the under the personal command of Tecumseh, who was sort of notable in this in this action, uh, as well as um, members of the the, the British regulars, uh, the regular soldiers. And uh, there are a couple of battles. And actually, when you look at the records of those battles, again, filled with nothing but praise for the behavior of the militia. This includes the Ohio militia. This also includes the uh, Michigan militia. And in the Michigan militia was at least one company of free blacks. Uh, they were actually listed at one point as free black renegados from Kentucky. So they had actually fled from Kentucky for whatever reason and came up to Detroit and voluntarily served uniformed in the Michigan militia and served in this sort of opening stage of the war. Um, which, again, is I, I really wish I had more time to devote to that, even in my theme. But it's, a, it's kind of a really interesting kind of twist on this whole thing, right? Because... The militia is supposed to generally be white men, property white men. And you have this company of men who are enthusiastically fighting uh, in a war that they can't possibly really care yeah. about. <laughs> but maybe they do, you know. But anyway, so uh, after all this happens, it, a series of sort of blunders and the, the fact that Hull can't, can't supply his men and is unpopular anyway. There's almost a mutiny uh, over whether or not they're going to oust William Hull and go out and fight the British before he surrenders. And ultimately, he surrenders on the concern that if he doesn't and the fort falls, the British force is largely made up of Native American allies. And the big risk with fighting with Native American allies and something the British were very fond of pointing out was that if you put up resistance in your fort and we capture it, there's no way that the British soldiers could control the savagery of the Native Americans. They're just going to go and butcher everybody. Mm -hmm. Partially a bluff. Partially true. It's, it's a complicated thing to unpack. Months after uh, Detroit Falls, there's the, the famous River Raisin Massacre. And, and so like things like that kind of get blown up in the consciousness and are really a big reason that, that William Hull decided, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to risk killing 3,000 men in order to defend mm -hmm. this fort. It's just not worth the loss of life. And uh, he felt like he was acting out of mercy and you know, was tried and convicted of treason. But for the most part, the story is you know, the Americans refused to or really couldn't logistically control the lakes at that time. And they couldn't logistically justify a very, very, very tenuous supply line going into Canada. So ultimately, it, I think it was logistical and strategic concerns that, that made Fort Detroit fall rather than poor leadership by William Hull. I think for the most part, he's justified in what he did. So the fort falls, and I believe it's very shortly afterwards that the British wash, march into D.C. and burn out the White House, right? Kind of goes after I have that. Uh, that's yeah. That's that's uh, that doesn't happen until 1814. So it's mm -hmm. it's after quite a few different things uh, have already gone. So what well, happens between the burning down of the White House and um, and the, the fall of Detroit? So I'll try to give the uh, the bullet points <laughs> because there's a lot and uh, there's a lot of very very interesting things that happen. But uh, essentially on the west on the western part of of the war, um, William Henry Harrison sort of takes over from William Hull as the kind of supreme commander of the Western Theater, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, but moving back up to Detroit fights a couple of, of uh, battles against sort of roving British patrols and everything. And ultimately the British um, go back across the Detroit River and try to fortify Amherstburg and Sandwich 
and leave Fort Detroit to be recaptured. Uh, after that, the Americans start an enormous shipbuilding campaign uh, on uh, Lake Erie. Uh, and this can lead to the kind of the famous Battle of Lake Erie. This is after about a year and a half of really sustained and extremely impressive uh, engineering on both sides uh, without proper ropes, without proper shipbuilding places. I mean, this was something that it's, it's on the scale of if you just kind of like go to the middle of, of nowhere right now in like Arizona and just plunk down parking lot and say, you know what, we're going to build a rocket ship and go to the moon right here. And it's, it's just an unbelievable feat of, of organization that either side is able to put anything in the, on the water that actually floats, let alone can hold cannons mm-hmm. and fight, you know, a sustained battle on both sides. But Americans narrowly win uh, the Battle of Lake Erie in October of 1813. And this actually leads to William Henry Harrison's invasion of Canada on the west side. This ultimately leads to Tecumseh, who was probably the most effective sort of British Indian commander at the time. Uh, it leads to his death. This is after, in sort of the central theater, this is like upper upstate New York, kind of um, western Pennsylvania area, the Niagara region. Isaac Brock, who is the commander, the British commander uh, in Canada, ends up getting killed at the Battle of Queenston Heights. So, you know, <laughs> you can blame it on the militia if you want to. But uh, this failed invasion in October of 1812 was kind of the last attempt to invade Canada in the first sort of season of the war. Um, and for the most part, and this is something I argue pretty heavily in my thesis, it was due to the fact they didn't have enough boats and they didn't have enough preparation for the attack. Um, but, um, you know, it's blamed on the militia anyway, because it's easier. There's actually a very interesting exchange of uh, two men sort of writing essays back and forth to each other about whose fault it is that Queenston Heights was lost. Wow. Uh, and John Armstrong Jr., who was the Secretary of War at one point, uh, essentially blamed Solomon Van Rensselaer, who was the um, the commander, the militia commander in New York. Um, Solomon's cousin Stephen Van Rensselaer wrote another tract, another long essay that basically said, "No, it wasn't the Van Rensselaer's fault. It was the fault of this and this and this and this." Right? Um, but this is the kind of this happens in the 1830s. These men are writing these these essays just 20 years after the fact. And they're still arguing about whether or not <laughs> it was the militia's fault or it was my fault. But anyway, there's not really much major that happens. There's a lot of raiding back and forth across the border after Queenston Heights and, and elsewhere. And there's not a lot of big movement. I mean, like cities, whole cities end up getting burned down, like Buffalo, uh, Fort York, which was where Toronto is right now. Uh, a powder magazine actually blew up and a piece of masonry fell from the sky and killed the American commander. And so it's it's a lot of sort of very um, short term raids and just the ability to try to either control or destroy enemy territory. And it was actually in this part that Americans start doing a thing that the Canadians and the British are very 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 sensitive to, and they start destroying mills. Yeah. When you think about that, it's like, well, what's the big deal, right? But the problem when you're destroying mills, those that's not only private property, which a lot of commanders were very sensitive about in the 19th century, but that's also it, it's responsible for feeding people. And if you destroy mm-hmm. a, a millstone, if you destroy a mill, that means that people can't actually grind their flour and they can't make bread and they'll starve to death mm-hmm. in, in the winter. So th- these were viewed as war crimes. And this is one of the many reasons that the British actually decided to burn Washington, D.C. to the ground. So along the East Coast, probably the only successful parts of, of the war for the Americans right off the bat are the naval wars. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, American frigates are a little bit bigger than British frigates. Mm-hmm. Frigates tend to operate on their own. So American frigates are going around sinking British shipping and capturing uh, ships and everything. And whenever they end up coming across another British frigate, they usually outweigh the ship and they have more men and they have more cannons. And there are a couple of very famous actions between American and British frigates in the early part of the war that the Americans very often tend to win. But that all sort of changes as the British are able to shift more of their resources to blockading the entire East Coast. And as part of that, starting in about late 1813, early 1814, they start raiding up and down the Chesapeake. So these are Marines who are sort of loading up and they're going into uh, the rivers and into the kind of wetlands of the South. And uh, they're raiding plantations. And along the way, they're freeing slaves. And they're taking those slaves and they're they're paying them as scouts and as raiders and as the informants and spies. And they're going to other plantations and they're freeing more slaves. And the idea was that you're kind of putting pressure on the American economy by attacking their yeah. logistics, right? Slaves are property. This is something you can see and this is something the Americans are acutely aware of. 
And the more slaves that you can free and then train and then turn around and use to fight against the Americans, the better. So one of the guys who's doing this is a guy named Sir George Coburn. I don't think he was actually knighted at the time. Um, he was an admiral. And it's actually spelled C-O-C-K-B-U-R-N, Cockburn. And in the American newspapers, everybody was loved to castigate Cockburn, right? And um, so he's doing his job, raiding up and down the Chesapeake. And uh, the Americans are sort of trying to put a stop to this. And they have their own raiders and they have their own people who are, are trying to, to put a stop to the raiding and everything. But eventually the British have this great big army that they land in Maryland and they start marching up toward Washington, D.C. And the idea was, you know, we're going to capture the capital city. Why not? It's not going to end the war, but it's a good way to put a lot of pressure on the Americans. This is kind of the late summer of 1814. And uh, they fight a <laughs> embarrassing battle. If you're an American, it's a very embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> it was called the, um, the Battle of Bladensburg. And it was right outside Washington, D.C. And it was, for the most part, militia backed with some regulars and backed with some actually former sailors, uh, U.S. Navy sailors that were under the command of, of a of a captain who were operating some uh, naval artillery on a hill overlooking a bridge that the British were crossing. Uh, in, any, in any case, for various reasons, uh, the Americans end up just turning tail and running when the British kind of cross this bridge and form up. And uh, it was eventually called the Bladensburg Races Oof. because the Americans ran away so quickly <laughs> and the British couldn't keep up. <laughs> so this is one of the other sort of examples of like the militia not being able to stand up and fight, um, uh, fight against British regulars. So, so, you know, the war is sort of going on, on and on. There's, there's various stages. There's, you know, the Western and the Indian War. There's the Southern Indian War. That's where Andrew Jackson is going around fighting the Creeks. Um, you've got the sort of Central Campaign, which is these just back and forth battles that end up really going nowhere. Um, the British are attempting to form a really big army and bring it down the, the um, uh, Lake Champlain. And it's just a, a sort of a back and forth mess, really. Nobody's going one way or another. And then the British capture Washington, D.C. And what they're doing is exacting revenge for burning down mills and destroying millstones. And there's one very humorous story about how the Americans actually took <laughs> books out of the library and never returned them. Uh, <laughs> but what the British were doing was actually destroying the public buildings. So this means like things like the library and the post office, the powder magazine and the White House. Right. So they weren't actually destroying the whole city. Again, they were very sensitive to not destroying private property because you're not actually fighting a war against the citizens of the, of the enemy country. You're fighting the government of the enemy country. Right. So you don't actually want to destroy anybody's house. It's just barbaric. And the, the one thing that Coburn did, uh, he sort of earned this reputation as being this very gallant, very dashing British officer was uh, there's a couple of stories about him that I really like. And one of them was he's about to burn down um, a print shop. He's burning down the print shops and he's personally destroying the seas as part of their, mm -hmm. uh, their you know, stamps, uh, the press, right? <laughs> because he doesn't want them to be able to slander his good name in the future. <laughs> burning down these print shops, whether or not this happens, I'm, I'm not really sure, but that's the story. But these women come out and say that their house is right next to this print shop. And if he burns it down, they'll burn down his house too, or their house. So what he does is he find a team he finds a team of of oxen and he straps them to the to like the center beam of this thing and just pulls the building down basically brick, brick by brick rather than put these women out on the street. So you know he's he's kind of developing his own sort of character in the same way that like William Henry Harrison and Andrew Jackson are by by being as sort of enthusiastically public and masculine as you possibly can be, right? This kind of like cartoon character of a British officer who's, you know, bowing to these women and saying, well, I won't burn down the print shop then. I'll just destroy it in a different way. Um, so this is, is probably the low point uh, for the Americans. In the meantime, they're, they're still trying to negotiate an end to the war, which they had been since the very beginning. Uh, and part of the problem is that the British are, they don't actually have any autonomy, the, the British diplomats, whereas uh, the Americans send Henry Clay, who is actually one of the war's agitators, uh, who sort of changed his mind pretty much right away. Uh, they also sent John Quincy Adams, who we all know eventually becomes the president. And the Americans have like their first string out there. These are like really well-known people, very, very, very long political careers. The British have like yeah. the clerk's clerk's clerk who's <laughs> sitting in Ghent. And anytime they propose anything, they have to send a letter back to London, get it approved, tell them what to do. Then they offer their counter offer. And it just takes a long, long, long time. Everybody's trying to end a war, but both sides are trying to wait for one big victory or another. 
to to really give up basically say like look the war is unwinnable you should just you know agree to whatever we have yeah uh, and the problem was right after the, the americans or the british captured dc they try to move on and capture baltimore and this is where we have the the francis scott key right the star spangled banner when the british are attacking the fort out in the oh yes that's right yeah and it doesn't work and the british are unable to capture baltimore and i think it's it's either right after they capture dc or right after they fail to capture baltimore there's this unbelievably huge hurricane that hits the east coast and it essentially destroys a lot of uh, british ships and a lot of their army and everything and this is actually something that's cited pretty often by you know people who believe the idea of manifest destiny and the idea of, uh, <laughs> sort of the spiritual victory of americans that this was god punishing the british right you know it's bad luck for the british um and they're not really able to capitalize on capturing washington dc in the way that they felt like they should, probably should have and so the americans are able to kind of hang on for a couple of more months so i've i've learned two things that uh nobody will stand up to defend dc <laughs> and that nobody the british have not spent enough time in new england or northeast west well yeah yeah they, they really uh should have been more prepared for that <laughs> So that that kind of like seems to settle it into a, a stalemate, really. It want, what could kind of draw us towards that general conclusion? What ends up pushing them toward the end of a war? Uh, probably the bigger factor, um, even though it'll irritate people who really like Andrew Jackson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that um, basically in eighteen in late 1814, the British beat Napoleon for the first time, right? So they, they have him. He's captured. The Napoleonic War is over. Uh, there's actually talk of uh, the British were actually going to send, um, um, not Nelson. Why can't I think of the guy's name? The the famous British commander. They're going to send him to Canada to deal with with this American thing. And the Americans are like, well, we can't have that. But the problem was the British decided to go ahead with an invasion down Lake Champlain. And this led to uh, the Battle of Plattsburgh. And the uh, this was basically Saratoga, the, the Battle of Saratoga for the War of 1812. This was a massive British army that if they had succeeded at Plattsburgh, they would have controlled Lake Champlain. They would have probably been able to reassert control of the Great Lakes, uh, and they would have been able to essentially cut the United States in half. They would have left the South to linger and uh, New England to kind of be on its own. New England at the time was actually already, it's complicated, but there was a potential for disunion uh, during the War of 1812. Oh, yes, that's right, yeah. Northern states to secede entirely. it probably wasn't a very serious threat, but the possibility definitely existed. And uh, this actually scared pretty severely. He was he was worried that he was going to be the president who failed to keep the union together. And it was a huge concern. Uh, ultimately, it ended up doing nothing. But the Battle of Plattsburgh was, was probably the more prominent victory uh, in the War of 1812 in terms of feats of arms. But it was overshadowed several months later in January of 1815 when Andrew Jackson won the Battle of New Orleans. This was another great, big, huge, you know, attempt to invade in the South. And the strategic aspect of New Orleans was all of the grain that American farmers produce in the Ohio River Valley gets floated down the Ohio River and eventually down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. And that's where it gets shipped out. Mm -hmm. So if the British control that, they can control the American farming economy, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Um, Ultimately, I have to say that doesn't work. And, you know, one of the things that people who are very eager to blame the militia always conveniently forget when they're talking about that is that the army at New Orleans is predominantly militia, right? It's, it's maybe a few hundred regulars. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. Are, are actually impressed militia who are <laughs> behind fortifications, but, but, and obviously that that's what sort of makes a lot of Americans tend to think, well, the United States won the war of 1812, right? The battle of New Orleans. Even though, you know, obviously everybody knows the story now that it, it happened actually after peace was signed. Uh, the, uh, the Treaty of Ghent was signed on December 24th of 1814. They called it the Peace of Christmas Eve. And the Battle of New Orleans didn't happen until early January 1815. So the war was already over, regardless of what actually happened. So this leads to the perception, of course, that the Americans just beat the tar out of the British, right? Even though when you actually look at it, like, okay, well, remember why we went to war? It was to end impressment. It was to... Uh, received the orders in council and it was to capture Canada, right? <laughs> and none of those. <laughs> but we definitely won, right? The United States definitely won. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, the militia aren't responsible. Right, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, like, you know, the, the fallout of the war itself is, you know, we could probably just do an entire podcast about that, but I know 
we don't have the time. So I'll have to have you back then, obviously. Yeah. So I think just to, to kind of brief, sort of truncate as much as I can, um, the, the war ends in a stalemate. Uh, obviously, none of the things that the Americans wanted at the beginning of the war were really dealt with, uh, even directly or indirectly. Um, you know, Orderson Council, the uh, the blockade had actually been, um, it had been uh, revoked before the war started. And this was after the, the war was declared. They're like, oh, oh, well, that was nice. Um, so that had already been repealed. So it wasn't actually mentioned in the treaty at all. Impressment was a non-issue now because Napoleon was defeated, at least at the time. And mm-hmm. so the Royal Navy they had no reason to impress American sailors anymore. They had no reason to impress anybody. They were actually trying to get as many sailors out of the Royal Navy as they possibly could because they didn't want to pay them anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a total non-issue. And um, I think the probably the biggest success that the United States had at the time was, you know, w- with regards to the Indian problem, right? Quotes over mm-hmm. that was because Tecumseh was killed. Uh, Tenskwatawa, the prophet, his power was basically cut off at the knees because of, uh, of the destruction of basically the, the areas that the, the natives fought in and destruction of their cities and, and the basically the destruction um, of the idea of the Confederacy. Yeah. Of the fact that all of the Americans in North America are going to band together to defeat the Americans. That dream uh, sort of gets put on. It comes back later, obviously. Um at other points in history, but at that time, it's it's considered a failure. Um, and individual tribes, individual nations, and bands start signing treaties with the, the United States uh, in 1814, and it goes on until the 1820s. They're still signing treaties as a direct result of the War of 1812. Um, so, if anything, I think one of the things people overlook is you know the United States didn't achieve its war aims, but what did happen was it completely obliterated the power dynamic in North America. Uh, and when the British are interested in what's happening in North America, uh, and they're involving themselves in American affairs and they're involving themselves in native American affairs, native Americans can, they can go to Fort Detroit. And when they're not given what they ought to have been given because of a treaty, they can say, well, I'm going to go to (laughs) Fort Malden, which is right across the river. And I'm going to get what the British promised me. Right. And they can play this very kind of shrewd game of playing the British against the Americans and vice versa. So that both sides try to treat them well. And the British had promised all sorts of political support and financial support. There was this notion at the very beginning of the war that there was going to be an independent native nation in North America that would have probably been centered uh, around the Great Lakes somewhere. And it, it very it would have permanently altered the political landscape of North America, but ultimately didn't happen. So anything that we can talk about that is totally counterfactual. It's fascinating yeah. to think about. but. Um, but ultimately, the destruction of this sort of power dynamic between the British and the Americans, because you, the British basically pulled out everything from North America. They didn't want to get involved anymore. They didn't want to spend the money in fighting another war in North America. So they kind of said, OK, we're, we're just not going to support Native Americans anymore unless they're in you, you know, uh, Canadian territory, unless they're in non-disputed territory, not the Great Lakes, and they backed off. And so the uh, Native Americans don't have anyone to sort of barter this power with anymore. So they're forced to deal only with the United States government. And because of that, that basically kind of launches the United States on the trajectory that it goes into in, in the, whole, the rest of the 19th century. Um, and eventually the idea of manifest destiny, it comes out of this sort of relationship where the only power broker in North America is the United States. And this comes down to um, even in the question of private citizens buying land from Native Americans, you know, say I lived in the Ohio River Valley or something like that. And I knew uh, a Native American down the road who owned a bit of land that I wanted and I could just go and pay him 20 bucks for it or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was actually considered by 1823 illegal. Um, If I wanted to buy Native American territory, I had to buy it through the federal government or through a broker appointed by the federal government. And this led to essentially the people in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as it eventually was known, as essentially just crooked land brokers. These are people who it's it's a it's a sinecure, a sinecure, right? They're they're people who are very very powerful, mostly because they control who gets the land that's broken up and taken from Native Americans. So that I think is probably the the biggest legacy of the War of eighteen twelve. I think if a couple of things had gone differently and the war had ended uh, in mm-hmm. a different way, if it had ended in a to the United States, more or less, um, that power relationship would have been very, very, very different. And 
again, we can't go into any details because it's totally counterfactual, but uh, it's, it's sort of a, a soft mm -hmm. thing, right? It's not, you can't look at it, the Americans got totally, completely obliterated by this war. There wasn't disunion, you know, there wasn't anything like that. But we do have this thing that is essentially solely based on the rather favorable result at the end of the war, even if the United States didn't achieve its war aim, it did get this huge, huge, huge political power out of it. Uh, and I don't think that it that that the impact of that can really be underestimated at all. I think that is probably one of the biggest factors in the development of America, not only as a country and a in part of you know a continental power, but but even as an idea. I think if yeah Madison and Jefferson's idea of what the nation could be had had kind of burnt to ruin because the the war had ended unfavorably, that it would have been a very different idea of what the country is and should be uh, would have come out of that. And, and again, it's, it's very difficult to articulate as you can probably tell <laughs> because it, it very, very easily lapses into, yeah, but what mm -hmm. if, and those are fascinating to think about, but uh, ultimately, you know, nobody can speak with authority. And so what you're happen. saying is that this would actually be the ideal history to write an alternative history around. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I figured like, there are there are tons of different things that I think somebody could play with, you know, just just on the um, on the basis of this idea of a, of an Indian nation, right, of a, of a native nation led by Tecumseh, one of the most famous men in history. So only if Harry, only if Harry Turtledove, the one who wrote the alternative history of the Civil War, wasn't so racist, we might actually have a better book series. Maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> It's an, it's an attractive idea for a role-playing game. So if anybody out there wants to, you know, run a, a very interesting early 19th century campaign, you know. It, you know, I, I could kind of get behind. It'd be a great idea for like a video game too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think this was great. I think you gave us like almost like the entire history of World War, uh, sorry, of the 18 or of 1812 uh, in like an hour. And I think that's really fantastic. But I know as with any questions like this, any topic like this, you will have lots of follow-up questions. So I hope you will come and join us in the follow-up thread and ask us turns. Yeah, I'll be there. Oh, great, great. Well, thank you so much, Adam. You have a good night. Yeah, thank you. You too. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.